Okay, we are going to begin. So good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Stubblefield Institute for Civil Political Communications at Shepherd University, I am pleased to welcome you to tonight's discussion, I-81, The Road to Safe Highways. I'm Greg Fields, the Acting Director of the Institute. One of the core values of the Stubblefield Institute is to foster civil debate and discussion regarding the vital issues that affect our daily lives. Often these issues are national in scope, but just as critical are the issues that affect our communities, the places where we live, work, and travel. Tonight's discussion then is an opportunity to assess and to understand the factors that make I-81 I such a distinctive and often harrowing route. And this is truly something that uh, does affect our daily lives. It is, a, it is part of the fabric of the Eastern Panhandle. Our panel tonight brings a wealth of experience and wisdom to the table and I'm pleased to introduce them. Ken Cloen is the District 5 Traffic Engineer for the West Virginia Division of Highways. He's been with the department for 15 years. He is a licensed professional engineer with great familiarity of the traffic in infrastructure in Virginia, Maryland, and West Virginia. Bill Keller is the Highway Occupational Safety Specialist for the West Virginia Department of Highways, District 5. Bill has the responsibility for handling major inc incidents on district highways, including I-81. And he is also a member of the I-81 Corridor Commission. Jim Ward is president of Maryland-based DM Bowman, a 400 unit East Coast carrier with eight terminals. Jim has been elected 2021-22 chairman of the Truckload Carriers Association. And he's also vice president at large for the American Trucking Association Executive Committee. Sheriff Nathan Harmon uh, joins us tonight. Following service in the Marines, Sheriff Harmon entered law enforcement as a West Virginia State Trooper and was named Trooper of the Year in 2001. He has since worked in private security, including protection for two US ambassadors. He's taught a number of uh, courses and techniques on firearms, security, and protection in various venues. And in 2020, he was elected sheriff of Berkeley County. That is our panel tonight. We're hopeful that Delegate Don Forsch will, will join us. But at this point, I think we have the depth and wisdom and expertise uh, to begin this discussion. Our moderator, we are pleased to say, is Amanda Carpenter. Amanda is a CNN contributor and columnist for The Bulwark. She's also the author of Gaslighting America, Why We Love It When Trump Lies to Us. Previously, she served as speechwriter and communications consultant to South Carolina Senator Jim DeMint and Texas Senator Ted Cruz. And we are absolutely delighted that she will be moderating this discussion tonight. And with that, I will turn it over to Amanda and the panel and the wisdom that they will bring to this topic. All right, thank you so much, Greg. Uh, I'd like to invite the panelists to go ahead and unmute uh, your speakers so we can start the conversation. But first, um, you know, I've lived in the Panhandle for 10 years now, and I have avoided I-81 every chance that I can. And so I hope that you can all make me feel more secure, more educated uh, about this road. And so I want to first start um, by inviting you each to talk about your relationship to this highway, what you were responsible for overseeing, and just your general perspective before we get into issues like how dangerous is this? How is it being improved? What can we expect? And so on. And so I'd like to kick it off with uh, Sheriff Harmon. Uh, then we can go to Bill Keller, Ken Cloen, and then uh, Jim Ward, because that is the order you appear in my screen. So please uh, tell us a little bit about what you've observed over the years, Sheriff. Well, I, you know, I've I've been here for a little over 20 years, just um, as Greg had mentioned, you know, uh, being up here as a trooper and then uh, in my capacity. Now, uh, I've seen um, a lot of accidents, unfortunate accidents on the interstate. Most recently, the, um, you know, the, the fatality that got uh, even the governor's attention uh, that occurred in February. 
Um, so uh, I was very pleased to be a part of an initiative called the I-81 Traffic Safety Initiative that was partnered not only by the Sheriff's Office, but WVU Medicine um, and, and uh, the West Virginia State Police, as well as the County Commission. And um, it has always been the effort by public safety, uh, as well as medical professionals, to look into the matter of how we can um, educate the public and uh, make our highways safer. And that is the uh, primary goal of the, the initiative. And we started that initiative, I would say it kicked off uh, um, in August. And since um, we have made a few videos um, is to help educate the public in regards to uh, uh, commonly seen traffic uh, violations. And we've I've spoken with uh, Bill Keller and, and, and Mr. Uh, Clohan. And, uh, we've had many meetings and discussions together uh, on how we can make 81 safer, not only in the work zones, but in general. Um, I believe um, signage and education and driver's training, um, um, I think, the needs to occur. And, and that's what our entire goal is. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, Mr. Clohan, the local emergency planning committee, uh, and Bill Keller uh, have taken a, a leadership role in helping us do that. Okay. Mr. Keller? Yes, I'm Bill Keller. I'm safety uh, officer for District 5, which includes all seven counties within the panhandle here in West Virginia. Uh, one of my major duties is uh, responding to major uh, accidents, crashes on the highways, uh, including I-81. Uh, and my duties there, uh, working in conjunction with the incident command to number one, get the roadway reopened as quickly as possible and as safely as possible, but also to make sure that, that road is safe to be reopened uh, as quick as possible there. Uh, also looking at, uh, you know, whatever else we can do to make the road safer. Uh, one of the things that I do see a lot is, is speed related. We, we need to, to get the traffic to slow down and, and pay attention. Uh, uh, those are the major uh, areas that I cover for I-81. Okay. Ken? Um, thank you. Um, Ken Clowen, uh, like I said, District 5 traffic engineer. Um, also cover the seven counties of the greater eastern panhandle. Uh, and um, my responsibilities include anything related to traffic, uh, whether it be uh, traffic signals or uh, traffic studies. Uh, work uh, hand in hand with Charleston and our traffic engineering division to uh, make them aware of, of issues and improvements that need to be made. Uh, whether it be a minor improvement or, or a major improvement. Um, but just work with all our different departments, uh, whether it be our construction department or maintenance department. Um, anything traffic related, signs, striping, signals. Um, and I, I've seen, lived here for my entire life and seen 81 just grow and grow uh, with the uh, traffic volumes and uh, with the uh, West Virginia trying to keep up with uh, the widening projects uh, uh, to keep the capacity and the and the safety uh, of 81 uh, in mind. Uh, that's in a nutshell. Okay, great, Jim. Well, first I'd like to say thank you to the Stubblefield Institute for including me in your program tonight. I certainly appreciate it. Uh, I am Jim Ward, president of DM Bowman Incorporated. We're a transportation logistics company located at the uh, crossroads of 1781 here in Maryland. Uh, but one of the main corridors that our equipment operates on is, is certainly 81 as we move goods from production to consumption uh, up and down from the north to the south. And uh, it's a heavily traveled corridor for, for our business. Uh, we've been around for 62 years. We were founded in 1959 by Don Bowman. Uh, I say one man, one truck. Uh, he started out driving himself and Hence, we've become one of the top 200 carriers in the nation today. And, um, you know, we, we have a very um, technological uh, fleet of equipment, you know, with, that includes collision avoidance. It includes two-way cameras, both inward-facing, outward-facing, 
lane departure equipment. We, we buy the most sophisticated <laughs> safety technology that's available to us to purchase on our assets. We also have uh, several million square feet of warehousing in this area. And so, and we have a number of large carriers that, uh, that require goods to be moving just in time on Interstate 81. And, uh, you know, so if and when there is a delay, it's, it's a, it creates a real challenge, not only for us, but for our customers. And, um, and so, you know, that being said, I would also uh, mention that, you know, through COVID, uh, we, um, we experienced fewer delays. Uh, now, maybe some people on this call will have uh, some additional data, but it seemed like there were there's somewhat less distractions in, in, in that corridor for us. And uh, I do believe distracted, distracted driving is a huge issue tied into speed. And, um, and so, but through that whole COVID process, why we kept America moving, kept goods flowing before we knew whether there was gonna be a vaccine or not. And, uh, and so hats off to our professional drivers and we really appreciate all the community outpouring and showing of appreciation and respect for what we do and how we do it as we continue to, to keep goods moving. All right. Um, you know, I guess I do wanna pose a question to the group. Um, crashes were mentioned. Um, when you talk to people around here about driving on 81, the same issues come up, the speed, um, the crashes. And so is, is I-81 this stretch more dangerous than other highways? Do people here believe that? Um, and and what, is, what are causing the problems? When we're seeing crashes, are there certain kinds of crashes that are more typical than others or not? Um, maybe the sheriff, since you're the one responding to these things all the time, um, would be best equipped to take that one first. Well, I, I think that is the stigma of I-81 now. I've heard even nicknames of death row. Um, my wife included avoids I-81. Uh, her mother uh, avoids I-81. Um, you know, and it, I think what has occurred over the years, we're victims of our own circumstance and um, we have shelved driver's education, uh, so much so that it is now optional if you want to take it uh, versus really? the part of curriculum. Yeah. And and, and you... Um, Do you know when that happened, if you don't mind my asking? I, maybe I, you don't know, but that's the first I've heard that driver's education is not required. Well, here, here's the thing. To get your license and drive in the state of West Virginia, you have, you're required to get 55 hours. Now, the parents or the guardians uh, are required to do that. And there's a certain portion of that that happens that has to happen during low, uh, low light conditions at night. Um, so, mm -hmm. so the, it, they have now left <laughs> it up to the custodians and it, you know, so, you know, what makes a good teacher, sometimes not always the parent. And I'm just and, laughing because my mom never took me on the highway. She said, your, your driver's ed teacher will do that. I don't want to go. <laughs> so I just understand well, so, that completely. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I thought, you know, th this is a double-edged sword. So one, we, we have to educate the public on what exactly is following too closely. Mm. Now, you can go as far back as a article that I found in March of 2014, written by the Herald Mail, uh, when uh, Sheriff Lamaster was in office and it discusses a, traffic accident involving two fatalities and 49 vehicles. Oof. And then in all that 49 vehicles, you had 13 tractor trailers. So, you know, there is a ripple effect that happens because what, you know, so educating the public on what exactly following too closely is uh, a proper lane change, a proper merge mm -hmm. onto the interstate, uh, I think is crucial because that, that skill set has been lost over the years. Um, on my drive over here, uh, the short little 15 minutes it took me to drive from one meeting over to here on the radio, there was another accident in the left-hand lane on the interstate southbound where a, a, a Mercedes hit a Jersey wall, uh, on, in the left lane. So that, you know, uh, I know the, uh, I, I believe, uh, someone mentioned distracted driving. Uh, that is huge. I mean, these things right here have literally taken over a lot of folks' attention off the road, and, and you got to kind of scratch your head. How do you hit a jersey wall in the left-hand side uh, if it wasn't <laughs> someone that forced you over there or you just wasn't paying attention yourself? Regardless, something occurred, driver's error, that, that, that 
contributed to that accident. So what that initiative that I spoke of earlier has done is we've launched one video through WVU Medicine's marketing division and, and that, that spoke of, of uh, our initiative and the goals, which is additional signage. Uh, and, uh, and the second video that we did that should be released any moment is where myself and the West Virginia State Police Sergeant Faircloth actually took the camera crew on the interstate and showed them the infractions we were talking about. Um, and where and are those part, videos going to be available? Are they like PSAs? One's yeah, one's available now. I'll be more than happy to share that if, if, you, if, if folks share their email with me here in the chat box. Uh, I can send that. And then the next video, any, any day now. Um, and, and I'm really looking forward to that next video. Uh, but as, as I... Oh, losing the sound on him. Is anybody else losing sound on that? Yeah, we lost it. No. Sheriff, we can't hear you. I revert back to that 2000 oh. that eerily similar to. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear now, me you're, now? now you're good. Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. So reverting back to that 2014 article, Kenny LeMaster was, Sheriff LeMaster was talking about adding maybe gates to the exit ramps because let's think about this. Let's think about the economical impact that an accident on the interstate has with a simple, uh, road closure of two hours. You're talking about tractor trailers hitting secondary roads or tertiary roads that they're not supposed to be on, uh, taking down low-lying power lines, um, um, and, and causing another accident on Route 11. And I took these stats from uh, the transportation department uh, in Charleston. You have literally over 72,000 vehicles on an average annual daily traffic on the interstate. Now, you take a fraction of that and you divert it off the interstate where Route 11 has over 19,000 vehicles daily and you add another 20,000 to it, just a fraction of the 72. Now you're talking about a lot of congestion, traffic circles are locked down, um, you have uh, deliveries that are late, people getting to jobs that they can't get to, uh, medical uh, deliveries that, that are delayed. I mean, I don't think, a lot, you know, I don't think there's been a monetary amount that you could probably put on a delay such as that, but it seems that fatalities sparked the interest as it is in this 2014 article where signage is talked about, gates are talked about, uh, and uh, I didn't read anything about driver's education, so, so that's fairly a new piece that we're adding, but we're talking about the same things now, and, mm -hmm. and I just want to make sure that we don't lose this, this momentum. And that's what makes this panel so crucial to me, important to me, is we can get that message across that people need to invest some more time in that driver's education training and, and, and vigilance that they need to have there on the roadways to just make it simply safer. Yeah. Well, let's stay on that point about what it takes to clear. I mean, obviously there's fatalities and we see those in the news, but there's a lot of other stuff that happens on the road that shuts things down, that leads to a frustration. But people are always talking about the delays. And Bill, since you're so involved with going to the scene and clearing that, can you speak to the average time and you know what it takes and why people are sitting there for so long? Because we've all been stuck in traffic saying, well, why can't they just airlift the car out and get them out of there? I mean, what the heck? A lot of times it's involving uh, tractors and trailers that's overturned uh, with partial load loss or, or actually. What do you mean by road loss? Like actually damaging the road? Yeah, so damage the load, but load loss, the loss oh. of the load in the trailer. Got uh, it. As the trailer has been compromised um, and it's spilled out. So that has to be cleaned up. A lot of times in order to upright the tractor and trailer, depending on where it went off the highway, if it went off the highway into a ditch or something, a lot of times it's gotta be offloaded prior to uprighting, so that takes time. Now, a lot of times we have fuel spills, so we gotta make sure that that's cleaned up off the roadway, make the roadway safe instead of being slick, so we don't have secondary crashes in that area once we open back up the road again. So that all takes time, uh, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of it's been happening in the construction zones where we have limited space to work. 
because of the Jersey walls on each side. So that adds to the time also where you don't, they can't position the tow trucks uh, to get the optimal lifts out of them that they need. So with the construction zones opening up, we should have quicker clearance uh, with these, you know, if we still continue to have the accidents, which we're gonna still continue to have them, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, until we get the public educated to, uh, like Sheriff was saying, slowing down, paying attention, not being distracted, uh, that all plays into it. Jim, have you noticed a higher incident of trucking accidents on 81 versus other roadways? Because it is, you know, a two lane road for the most part, people are going fast. It's hard to see around these trucks and people often bring up how worried they are about the big trucks on that road um, going through. So what, what have you seen from your people on the road there? Well, thank you, Amanda. I, first, I would say, going back to the comment that the sheriff made, there is there's absolutely no doubt that the volume of traffic on Interstate 81 continues to increase. As we all know, or may, may, maybe don't know, in the nation, 70% of the nation's goods are moved on a truck. Again, so that's how we get most of what we receive uh, as consumers. And uh, there was a congressional uh, report released in March of 2021 and now it covered Maryland, this 12 mile section in Maryland on 81, but there was an, on average about 19,600 trucks a day that passed uh, through I-81 here on that stretch in Maryland, which is about uh, in the top 1% of truck volume by lane mail in the nation. So there is quite a bit of, of truck movement as I think we would all agree on this on this call. And I, and I would tell you, talking about the crashes, so we, we run collision avoidance systems on our trucks, as well as the cameras, as I mentioned to you. And what's and that exactly? So collision avoidance is, is it's, it's space management technology that keeps you a safe distance from the vehicle in front of you. And, and uh, I would just share with you that if you spoke to any of our professional commercial truck drivers, or you looked at the data coming off of our collision avoidance systems, you would see that <clears throat> there's no such thing as space management on I-81. When there is space, somebody uses it and takes it. And, and so, you know, there's a lot higher volume of, of uh, general publics. Can you, can you explain what you mean? So your truckers on 81, they all have space management systems. It does something like beep, beep, beep when it gets too close. But there's that's, people, that's because correct. the road is so dense, that's there's correct. no way to keep the space. Yeah, so we're operating in the 21st century on a 20th century highway and, and certainly needs attention. And you know, I, I understand the dollars that's been available in the Highway Trust Fund and some of the challenges that we've had, you know, from a state perspective, being able to get dollars from the federal government, which we as an industry have continued to encourage raising the federal fuel tax to help cover these costs to be able to not only maintain, but build out the highway system, uh, how important it is. Because as we look for, at projections in the future, freight volume based upon customer, de customer demand is not going down. It's going to continue to increase. And so, so again, we put this technology on our equipment for the safety of our commercial drivers and the general public. It's our number one objective to be a good neighbor on our nation's highways. But, but being able to effectively manage that today with what's happening is become, with congestion is becoming very, very difficult. As I mentioned to you earlier, our equipment that we have basically just running on Interstate 81, I just pulled the last 45 days of those, those trucks, technology, the speed on those trucks, the average speed on those trucks on Interstate 81 is 47 miles an hour, which is probably surprising to most of the people on this call. And the reason for that is congestion. Now, it's the world we find ourselves in today, but we all know that it's, it's a problem and it's not going to get any better until we start to do something from a build out, from an infrastructure standpoint. And in surveys that we've done with the general public as an industry, we have found that the general public supports building out infrastructure and realizes that there's a problem. And I would also tell you with the cameras that we're operating on our equipment that are triggered based upon a, a, a hard break event or, or a, a movement in the truck a certain way that it will trigger the camera to go off. Everything you think is happening in these, in the, with the general public in these vehicles is happening from a distracted driving perspective. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I don't know what our, I, I feel for our, our police officers and our emergency vehicle people that have to, first responders that have to respond to the scene to these crashes, 
But until we get some discipline built back into the system and get the systems built back out, um, I don't see it getting much better. Let me just follow on with, because I, I guess I would like to hear a little bit more from you about why I-81 is such a critical trucking route. Because, you know, when you're driving, you wish you didn't have to be on the road with all these trucks. But at the same time, why is 81 become such an important trucking route? So it's, 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 it's fairly easy to answer. Think goods move from production to consumption. And where are most goods produced nowadays? In the South. And where is a significant group of folks consuming it? In the North. And so it's a, it's a huge route. And, and again, your alternative is 95. And okay, so it's mostly it, moving goods from the South to the North because you also see a lot of factories being built along that corridor as, as well because yeah. of the accessibility to the route. But you think it's primarily transporting goods from the South up. It's mo it moves in both directions. Yeah. But I would tell you, uh, there's a lot of product moving out of the South to the North. Now, some of the, some of the, our top customers, they're moving goods in both directions mm. to be able to keep plants up and running. And, and that's a challenge. When there is a crash of any sort or a delay for these manufacturers that are, that are uh, depending upon just-in-time service, the cost per hour when those manufacturing facilities go down because they don't have those parts and those goods to be able to keep themselves up and running, it's the numbers or the dollar amounts are astronomical. Hmm. Okay. Now, Ken, since you focus a lot on the highway design, can you tell us, I mean, are there structural problems with this road that do make it lead to the congestion? I mean, obviously there's the things that are be trying to fix with the construction, but can you tell us what the existing problems are? Uh, well, just, uh, just in our area in West Virginia, uh, we've been addressing some of the uh, congestion with widening. Um, and with the, the latest project that's underway um, down to Tabler Station, um, you know, in the future, I would expect to see widening uh, further south uh, down towards the Virginia line. Um, but uh, that that's the that's the main thing. If that's the question you're you're asking, as the, as the traffic volumes increase, we have to increase capacity, and then and then also having three lanes makes it safer. Uh, for the trucks and the cars so that the trucks can stay in the in the right lanes and then and then the cars can get out there in the left lane if they need to. Yeah, I've also I just had a question about that because I have read that the stretch through West Virginia in particular has a lot of um, exits or interchanges, but the the merge lanes aren't as long as they could be in order to lead to better flow. I mean, I'm not an engineer, it's not my specialty, but I thought maybe you could speak to whether that's a factor. Um, so some of and them- And then the curving uh, of the road quite often as well. Right, since, since the road was built in the, in the 60s, some of the, some of the uh, exits, uh, the entrance ramps, uh, you know, aren't, aren't, don't meet the current design guidelines uh, uh, for- And what would those guidelines be? I mean, what would, if you were, looking for a safe highway what would you be looking for well it, it just it just varies based on the geometry but uh um you, you need more merge area in some places and uh you know a lot of the improvements uh that are made in our area are based on safety data if we find more more crashes in an area we try to make improvements in that area um similar to adding a uh, guardrail in the, in the median when we had uh, uh, crossover type crashes and you have head on crashes um, south of Tabler Station uh, Road. Okay, and what is the what is the construction that's underway now? And do you have any timelines for when that might be completed? Because it seems like there's been some stuff going on for a long time. <laughs> right. Um, there, the, the project that's uh, uh, getting close to being completed uh, is between uh, exit eight, Tabler Station Road, and exit 12, Apple Harvest Drive, uh, widening of the interstate. Um, and uh, they're almost finished. They did, they did get traffic uh, onto the three lanes in both directions, but, uh, but the surface isn't finished yet. They're still running on the base asphalt. So they'll have some work to do in the spring to finish that up, uh, finish up the, 
remaining markings and signage. Okay. Uh, is that base off all, is the part that's kind of um, rough to drive on right now? Is that, is that going to be smoothed over soon or is that right. a next year that, kind of thing? That that will be in the spring. So okay. it's, it's really too cold right now to put that surface course down. Um, it would it would be too rough and wouldn't get good compaction so it wouldn't hold up uh, if if they tried to place that surface uh, mix uh, now and in, uh, in December okay so a little little rumbly till spring is what you're right. saying okay. right <laughs> um sheriff I know that you I, I don't know if it's you personally or the department and exactly who does it but there were speed cameras placed in certain areas um have you noticed a difference I mean are those are those enforced what's what's going on with those <laughs> now, now, uh, uh, Amanda, I, I, I got to correct you on the camera side of things. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Speed monitor. What do you call that thing? <laughs> a, a, a traffic monitoring device. Or, okay. Uh, Where does that uh, information know, go? What is done with it? <laughs> I didn't, you know, I don't mind cameras, but they are uh, statutorily not allowed in the state uh, a, a, as we speak now in the present. But uh, those devices are from all traffic solutions. And what I love about these devices is it, it's extra eye candy for the driver. Uh, aside from your standard DOH advisement sign that flashes uh, and continues to flash if you're over the speed limit, these all traffic solution devices, and we have two of them, um, they collect data. And they don't collect data in the form of license plates or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> they There's... Parameters set the. I just assume it's going to come back. Depending on where you put it, whether it's interstate or secondary, and so the people that and it monitors uh, that abide by the speed limit. So it is it puts this data in different graphs and and in, in terms of what you're trying to uh, gather data on. So if we're putting it on the interstate and we want to see how many people are abiding by the speed limit versus how many people are speeding 10 miles per hour over. We can do that 20 miles per hour. We can do that. Um, what I love about it recently, the reports that I get from it, because you can look at these reports from your mobile device or anywhere and you can change settings on them. So it'll say, you know, it'll flash uh, uh, 70 miles an hour. Thank you for doing the speed limit. If you're going uh, 10 over, it'll flash. If you're going 15 or more over, it'll flash, say slow down, and then you'll see the red and blue strobes. And a driver's mind at that point <laughs> kind of runs the gamut of things when they think that maybe their picture was taken, maybe a, a, a law enforcement officer is getting ready to pull out on them. And the statistic that that returned in a literally a four week period that we had it on the interstate was that it had a 73 to 78% effective rate of slowing people down. So much so that while we had it out there in the work zones, the workers, the DOH workers out there doing the interstate work uh, noticed a difference. Their spouses would email us or send us messages saying thank you. And citizens would send us messages saying thank you. Um, you know, so it's, it's it's got a huge impact so far uh, on the interstate and 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 slowing people down. Um, they're they're multifaceted machines. They're they they are they're solar powered. We can charge them here. We can set them out even on an overcast of it, the batteries can last 90 days. We can move them anywhere we want if there's a traffic complaint, especially from my position uh, when it comes to manpower. Uh, where do I need to dedicate that manpower at? These machines help me do that. And when we deploy them, we can deploy them as message boards um, for the holidays. Happy holidays from Berkeley County Sheriff's Office. Please, uh, please slow down, drive responsibly. Whatever message you want to put on there, uh, it, it relays that message for you. So they're, they're a, a vital tool in the, the initiative to trying to get uh, people to drive more safely. Wow. So it sounds like those are not going away. Um, and what are they called again? They're all traffic solution devices. Okay. Do you uh, think you anticipate you would get more for the area since they, yeah. I mean, 15, well, how do you view them? Are they a control tool? Or they're just a tool to assist law enforcement. 
and provide you guys information? Uh, both. They're, they're a community resource as well as a public safety resource. So like I said, they, they're, you can use them for COVID test sites. You can use them for all kinds of messaging. But at the same time, uh, you can use them to collect data. The machines don't even have to be on for it to collect data. So if, hmm. if, if we're looking at an area that is... is and by data, in, you mean the speed data. You cut out for a little bit. You said they weren't collecting license plates, not taking images. Are they taking images? Right. No. Okay, so what is the data that they collect? Just speed? They, they collect the uh, people that are abiding by the speed limit, uh, okay. people that are violating the speed limit, um, people that are violating the speed limit and slowing down. <laughs> so it, it, it actually it monitors the effectiveness of the sign itself. Okay, and, and where is that information? It goes to you guys? Is it publicly available? How is no, it? It's, it's software where we have an account and it goes to what we call a traffic cloud. And then it stores that information there where we pull it. And depending on how you structure the means of how you want to receive the data, it puts it in various graphs. And if I could actually have it here, if I could just real quick, just kind of flash some, some pictures here. Um, here's part of it. Um, Here's some graphs. Looks like a naughty are, and nice list of drivers. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it it it's uh, you 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 it's GPS uh, monitored. Uh, you're you're putting in the data where you have it located, so you're not re-entering it every time you move it to the same spot uh, in different places. But um, it, it's it's very user friendly. Uh, they're fifteen thousand dollars a piece. Um, and we purchased two of them. Uh, we've talked to uh, folks from the Governor's Highway Safety Program, had them up here, did a presentation for them on these machines. Uh, and they love them. They're looking at investing in them. Lost you a little bit. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward. Okay. Sorry, I don't know if you dropped off for other people, but uh, Jim, if you can hear me, um, I'm, I'm curious because there are so many sort of reforms that get batted around for the roads and different things you can do. Are there things that the trucking industry supports in terms of um, just consistent highway standards, speed limits, um, in the interior things that you guys are doing in tracking in terms of like truck arrest and all that? Because I know there's a lot of regulations that go along with this. What do you think is needed to improve highway safety? Well, uh, so so an average driving employee has on average 11 driving hours a day. In our industry today, as we're sitting here having this conversation, the average driving associate drives 6.8 hours a day. So they're nowhere near maximizing the total hours that they have available to them. And look, I'm not sitting here, I'm not sitting here saying that the hours should be expanded. All I am saying is, is because some of the things that we're sitting here talking about, their amount of hours that they're able to drive and move America's goods every single day is really being minimized. And, and so it's a huge productivity hit for the industry. Meaning because yeah. of the congestion you were talking about earlier? Yeah, congestions, delays, et cetera. And uh, so th there is a, there's a great opportunity to increase and produce, produce productivity. Last, last year, well, not last year, in 2019, before COVID, the average number of hours lost because of the data that's fed into the system through satellite communication, which is on all of our trucks now, tracking electronic logs, the average number of hours sitting for drivers for the year was 1.6 million hours. That's the average of 425,000 commercial truck drivers not moving a single mile in an entire year. So just to give you a feel, it, it's, 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 eight, it's 81 that we're sitting here talking about this evening, but there are congestion and, and constraint issues all over our nation. And, and the loss of productivity that we're experiencing as a result of that is, is really significant. And then as we're sitting here today talking about the supply chain crisis and moving goods and not be able to get goods moved because of the lack of workforce development or labor, just think of that number I just shared with you, about 425,000 setting, not moving a single mile for an entire year. So it's, it's, it really needs attention. And you know, we've, 
we've kicked this infrastructure deal down the road for years. And uh, it's because finding the dollars to pay for it's an issue. There haven't been enough dollars really in the highway trust fund to do the maintenance on the highways, let alone build them out. Now I'll tell you, we're really excited about some parts of the current infrastructure bill that passed because it is the largest dollars going to be applied to highways and roads that we've seen in a long time. There are 38% more dollars associated with this infrastructure bill than at any point in time in history. Now, how they get deployed and where they're used and how those areas that are gonna be identified as either shovel ready or in certain phases of, of, of work and repair is, is kind of above my pay grade, as you said earlier, about being an engineer, but there is a great opportunity to start to be able to provide relief. And one of the biggest frustrations that we hear from our commercial drivers is a lack of truck parking. And so, you know, again, talking about a safety issue, when you start to see these trucks pulled down and these off these ramps and all through the night and because individuals are trying to get to rest and there's nowhere for them to park, it's a real issue. Hmm. And, you know, I've mentioned many times before as I look at some of these rest areas and not to be critical, but the landscaping in them is nicer than the landscaping I have at my home. So maybe there's a chance to remove some of that landscaping and add additional parking so that we... <laughs> yeah, when it comes to, I mean, who's responsible for providing truck rest areas? Because, you know, just from what I observed, they're all commercial retail for the most part. So is there, I mean, where, where are they supposed to be parking? <laughs> if they well, I'll yield probably to some of my other colleagues on the, on the call here who probably knows where they have parking throughout I-81 on West Virginia and what the plans are to maybe to build that out and if there are any dollars available to be able to do that or consider it because it's a real issue. Yeah, um, I do have a couple questions in the chat that I will ask and throw open to the group. Um, this is specific. Is there a possibility to get the lane markings corrected at northbound exit 12 and northbound on ramp at exit 8? Bill or Ken, speak to that one. Um, I, I, I'm not aware of any issues, but I can definitely check it out and and see if anything can be done if there is a problem there. Okay. Um, other people, and this has come up a few times, um, people want to know statistically if um, the accidents on I-81, how they compare to other stretches of interstate, if anybody has any knowledge about that. Um, I did I did get some information, uh, updated crash data, uh, hasn't been completely double checked yet. Um, I mean, I assume there's annual reports, where would the public look for that kind of information? Is it produced in like a Department of Transportation report somewhere um, where people can track that? Um, I'm not I'm not aware of anything right now, um, but but just looking at the crash rate for the last five years on 81, um, it's it looks like it's still below average uh, compared to the rest of the state, um, and uh, you know just comparing interstate crash rates versus. Um, you know, like a U.S. route, uh, you know, crashes are typically two to three times crash rates. Be clear, I'm talking about crash rates because uh, the higher the volume of traffic, the more crashes you're going to have. But um, I don't have the exact date on like U.S. Route 11, a two-lane road, um, but it would it would typically have a higher crash rate than Interstate 81, where you have wide shoulders and and opposing traffic is separated, uh, um, if that makes sense. But Interstate 81 is is usually uh, the crash rate is lower than the average uh, for the rest of the state in, in West Virginia. OK. Um, and I do think in terms of safety, there are, you know, we're all drivers. Um, you know, we have law enforcement, we have trucking, we have engineers on this call, but ultimately who, who is responsible for making this stretch of highway safe? Is it members of, you know, are they elected officials um, who decide the funding for it? But if you want to make this highway safer and you are some member of the public watching this because you're so interested, who do you talk to to make sure that this gets done? 
And where do you go for updates? And I'll just invite anyone on the panel to respond to that. I think, I honestly feel that it's a shared responsibility, all of the above, Amanda. I, um, you know, you look at uh, uh, someone in my position, I think I am obligated to keep the momentum going in the attention that needs to be um, given to this specific situation. I brought up the 2014 article. We're talking about it again. Um, we definitely need to do something about it. Uh, a bigger investment needs to occur. Um, uh, and, and this is not by any means am I uh, talking poorly on our governor, but the governor allotted $10,000 to the West Virginia State Police to uh, shortly after the February accident to help uh, conduct traffic enforcement. The governor's highway safety program has various initiatives built into it for uh, uh, traffic enforcement, whether it be DUI. Well, just let me, let me ask, is $10,000 a lot of money to do that? That doesn't seem over, like much. It was, it was over in a month and a half. Okay. It was used up in a month and a half. So, you know, um, one could tell, you know, low manpower from a public safety standpoint, uh, when we're dealing with a higher population as Berkeley County specifically has seen a 3% growth every year in, in, in population. And some, most of the parts of other states uh, of this state has seen a decline. We have not. And, and so our population increases, the traffic increases, um, so uh, a much larger investment needs to occur from uh, Charleston, from the county, uh, and we need to continue to have these discussions to, to make sure that we're relaying the importance of, of the impact an accident has when it occurs on the interstate. And can you be specific from an enforcement perspective, what do you need more funding to do? Well, the investment into technology. Okay. Um, so, so message boards, uh, uh, more of those. We, I believe we have one north, one south. Uh, and you said those are $15,000. That's not right. Well, uh, the, the all traffic solution message boards are, um, I'm speaking in terms of more of the Department of Highway message boards that you'll see uh, at the north end and one there at the south end. Uh, we need others uh, in the midst of those, in the middle of those that can warn of traffic accidents ahead. Um, I think we need to look closer at potentially exit ramp gates to take uh, You know, commercial, when commercial vehicles hit our ferry roads, it's a problem. It is a huge problem. Um, so we definitely need uh, additional signage, uh, investment in signage. Uh, I know there's signs out there that um, can uh, show in a very simple form a proper lane change. I've seen them. They're just not here. Um, reminder of seatbelts, reminder of cell phones, um, signs that restrict uh, commercial vehicles to the right lane only. Um, so, and, and there needs to be a lot more of those in this 25 mile, uh, stretch. So when you talk about responsibilities, I think it comes from not only a public safety, but, um, uh, our state government and county government as well. Okay. Well, let's stay on this theme about what else is needed to improve safety aside from the existing widening project. Um, Bill, what, what do you, what would you suggest? Well, I know that there's a project that's getting ready to start uh, after the first of the year for more, I'm, I'm gonna use street lights uh, around the uh, both north and south down the whole interstate. Okay. Mainly around the exits and all uh, to give better view at night of, of what's there on the road. Um, yes, we do need some more message boards that has been uh, requested and hopefully with the infrastructure uh, money coming in that we can put more up, but there is currently there's two message. Well, hold on. By infrastructure, do you mean the like build back better Biden yeah. program or different infrastructure money in West Virginia? Uh, no, the, 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 okay. the federal. Yep. Um, there is currently two message boards southbound. There's one at, uh, basically at state line and one down to 19. And then we have one going northbound uh, message board at the half mile marker. So uh, those could help. So, and again, like Ken's been saying, with the volumes, uh, probably going to look at 
more widening, get more lanes in there uh, because of the congestion. So. Okay, actually, Bill, we have a question in the chat uh, that I think comes to you. Uh, what type of investigation is performed after a major accident and are the results of the investigation made public? I'm gonna to defer to the sheriff on that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I tried to type a little bit uh, oh. to give a general bullet on that. Um, uh, you know, our, our media outlets do a pretty good job on major accidents and, and reporting. Uh, you know, you have your social media, uh, our platforms that we have uh, on social media. But uh, as far as the traffic accident reports themselves, uh, individuals uh, that have involvement within the accidents, um, can come to that respective law enforcement agency and request a copy. Okay. Um, well, the one I'll throw up to the group. Exit 12 is a congested nightmare, both attempting to exit the highway and on Apple Harvest Drive in both directions. Continuing to build west on Highway 81 will only compound the problem. Are there long-term plans to ease the congestion? Um, we do have a project to widen Apple Harvest Drive. I, I, I don't believe it'll start until after the first of the year, but it is under contract. Um, and it'll add, add more lanes on Apple Harvest Drive, help, help with that congestion. Um, we're also looking at a, a phase two uh, for that project of uh, making improvements to the um, northbound off ramp at exit 12, possibly splitting the ramp uh, so that it, uh, Traffic going to um, Foxcroft Avenue could go straight through, um, um, and then any anybody turning left uh, um, would use the other ramp. So sort of splitting that ramp. It's not nothing's been approved yet. That's just what came out of an initial study for improvements to that uh, Apple Harvest Drive corridor. Okay. Um, let's see. I. I want to revisit the topic of what could be done to improve things. And Jim, I know you are truckers want roads and everybody's talking about their hope that this uh, build back better program is going to lead to more investment in the roads. And so I want to ask you what you think about that, um, how people will be able to potentially track whether that money can come here to I-81 um, I'll get your thoughts on that, and then I'll invite Jim, or excuse me, Greg, uh, to maybe come back in and close us out. So take it away, Jim. Is this all going to be better? Well, let me first say this, Amanda. I, uh, I certainly agree with uh, Sheriff Harmon's comments that we're, we're all in this together. I mean, it's, it's the general public. It's the, it's the commercial motor carriers. It's law enforcement. It's the state highway administration. It, it, it's all of us in this, in this whole game together. And you know, anybody on here that doesn't participate, if you're from a business or what have you with your metropolitan planning organization, I would highly encourage you to do so because if and when these dollars come available, you know, how they get allocated is really important. And, and God rest his soul, uh, you know, our, the dear Senator Byrd, I mean, <laughs> he, quite a legacy he left on Corridor H, but every time I go out over there, we serve as a customer out right that way. I think about how those dollars could have been used towards I-81 and and how maybe some of these issues that we're sitting here talking about today, you know, might have been somewhat behind us. And I know there's a whole lot of reasons why things are done, but Tabor Station is another good example that's been mentioned here tonight several times. When you look at the facility and facilities that have been built in that area and the required infrastructure now, future forward, that's necessary to be able to service a couple of those facilities, it's, it's huge. And you find yourself sometimes behind the eight ball. And so trying to get ahead of things, paying attention to the future, you know, making sure those dollars are allocated appropriately. Now, to your, to your question about the infrastructure bill. So, so the Build Back Better bill, as I understand it, is more the, um, it's the bill that's being considered right now for reconciliation. The infrastructure bill, which is what has been passed, which has several billions of dollars that's going to be allocated to the highways over the next five to 10 years, is, is really important. And seeing that those projects in that quote unquote shovel ready arena, that those dollars go to those high priorities where there is opportunity to make absolutely sure that we're improving highway safety, that we're improving the free flow of commerce, that we're making people's lives better that are commuting to their workplaces every single day, I think are major priorities. 
but but making sure that those dollars are used accordingly and appropriately, you know, I think that's going to get back to the governors and the state highway administrations and the planners and the engineers and and uh, so. But I think they know, for the most part. I'm sure there's people on this call with us here tonight. They know where the need is, and and all we can hope for is that they get applied accordingly to those areas where there's real opportunity. And truck parking, hopefully. <laughs> Get them off the ramps. <laughs> All right, Greg, I'll hand it over to you. Great, I, I wanna thank everyone for your time and excellent thoughts. One of the things that has occurred to me throughout this discussion is a real sense of encouragement that in fact, something that, that is such a common part of our life and such, a, such an easy thing to, to really feel bad about driving on I-81 is occupying so much collective thought and care and concern on the part of people from various aspects of the public and private sector both that that's very encouraging, that's, that's very comforting that in fact, as was stated earlier, we are all in this together. And we, by driving safely, by being aware, by being sympathetic to the other people on the road with us, and by understanding that no road is perfect, but we need to navigate it as carefully and as, as uh, thoroughly as we can, um, we can get through this together. So my thanks to all of you, this was, a, a, an enlightening discussion and uh, thank you for giving a part of your evening. Thank you to the audience and we hope that we can do this again sometime. All right. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thanks everyone.